Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us for week eight of our Northern Light Health Business to Business Zoom conference. I am Karen Hawks, Vice President of Operations at Northern Light Beacon Health. Based on feedback many of you provided, we have changed our format for today and we'll focus on schools and youth serving organizations. As a parent and as a school board member myself, I understand the time and effort you are contributing behind the scenes to ensure the safest start to the new school year for your students and staff. Your innovation and flexibility continues to amaze me. And on behalf of the Northern Light Health System, I want to applaud your efforts and say thank you. Over the past several weeks, a number of Maine school districts have reached out to Northern Light Health seeking assistance to establish a safe return to school plan. And as you know, two weeks ago, Governor Mills released guidance to support school systems across Maine as they consider in-classroom instruction. Today, our guests will share insights, lessons learned, and recommendations for reducing risk for COVID-19 and youth anxiety in school settings. We have also invited a special guest to join us from the University of Maine today to discuss health literacy and communication strategies. But before we get started, I will read our legal disclosure. The coronavirus pandemic is an ongoing, continuously evolving situation. Northern Light Health encourages everyone to follow federal and state governmental guidance and mandates. Northern Light Health does not know the particulars of your situation, so the information presented today is general in nature and is based upon Northern Light Health's own experience, which may or may not apply in your specific situation and which may be revised as we learn more about the coronavirus. Accordingly, following any guidance Northern Light Health presents today in no way guarantees that you, your employees, and or your customers and clients will not contract or spread the coronavirus. We've, de we've designed this hour to offer you practical advice and useful information. I invite you to join in our conversation by asking the experts questions that will help you with pl your planning and decision making. Please use the chat function whenever a question comes to mind and I'll do my best to track the questions and we'll ask our experts questions following today's presentation. Also to help us get a little more detail on how we can best support your efforts, we'll be, we will be emailing a five question survey following our Zoom conference today. I encourage you to take a moment and provide us with feedback and ideas for the future. Now it is my pleasure, pleasure to introduce to you today's panelists. Welcome back to Dr. Jim Jarvis, the Senior Physician Executive and Director of Clinical Education at Northern Light Eastern Maine Medical Center. Dr. Jarvis, Jarvis also serves as the COVID-19 Response Incident Commander. We have Dr. Howard Jones, the Medical Director for Northern Light Work Health. Joel Farley, the Associate Vice President of Facilities Management for Northern Light Health. Suzanne Morrishead, a Registered Nurse and Infection Control Specialist for Northern Light Health. Chris McLaughlin, a licensed clinical social worker and associate vice president of community and pediatric services at Northern Light Acadia Hospital. And special guest, Chrissy Townsend, a professor at the University of Maine, a health literacy expert, and a member of the UMaine Science Advisory Board. Today we'll get started with Dr. Jones, Joel Farley, and Suzanne Mooreshead a multidisciplinary team that has been working closely with schools to identify risk mitigation opportunities. Dr. Jones, I will let you set the stage for your team. Thanks, Karen, and welcome everyone. I appreciate your attendance, and those of you who I've met, uh, at least by telephone or Zoom in the past, welcome back, and if you're new, welcome as well. As Karen alluded to, we'll have uh, time for questions at the end. So I'll try and keep my remarks brief, which is everyone on the phone who knows me knows is difficult. Uh, basically, I, I want to start by saying that this is a very, very fluid situation. It's both politically and scientifically complex. Um, the things to remember is any planning you um, make for this needs to be written in pencil, as it were, showing my age. And you need to be flexible in the way you design a school systems reopening. Because again, the science is being written as we live through the experience. But in the end, the virus is a coronavirus and behaves typically like coronaviruses do. And those are simple facts. Um, basically, we understand that different types of businesses who we engage with have different needs and that school systems in different settings, such as public schools, parochial schools, or universities can be very different places. Uh, so the information we're gonna try and give is going to be as general and generic as we can, but applicable to a school setting. 
uh, the key things to remember really are to identify progressive alternatives within each model. Each one of your schools within a school district may be physically very different. And of course, the students' ages and behaviors may impact the spread of a virus. Uh, the kids have to get to school and be fed and get home safely. And of course, uh, all that exists within the realm of different uh, risk exposure categories based on where the students might live, whether it be the southern part of the state, which has had higher incidence and prevalence of disease than northern, or whether it's in a rural area. Uh, you need to basically start by defining universal rules and addressing as a group with your reopening committees and particularly with the parents, your constituencies, if you will, whether everyone will be screened and everyone will be masked, how that will occur and where that will occur. And once there are a set of standard rules, and there's a lot of information available on uh, references we'll provide near the end of this and of course on, on the internet and through the education department, you need to establish whether there'll be exceptions and how those might work. Uh, the most complex issue really involves screening, how much screening occurs and where, which involves both uh, testing for coronavirus, which at the moment in the state is limited, but becoming more available, but time limited also, it takes time to get the results, but also screening such as temperature checks and you know health checks uh, prior to getting on buses, once on buses, at doors, what doors are used, etc. Like any good person, I would of course hold myself as the expert who knows everything, but I know I'm not that person. So I've invited friends along on our adventures as we've worked with several school systems and also university systems. Uh, and I would uh, invite those uh, co-workers, Joel Farley up next, to describe facilities issues and Suzanne Morshead in the Infection Pre Prevention Department. And they can provide further insight in the coming slides. Again, you can ask questions as you need to along the uh, chat box process and we'll track on those and try and answer them near the end of all of this. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Um, as mentioned prior, my name is uh, Joel Farley. I'm the Northern Light Health uh, Associate Vice President for Facilities Management. Um, I'm an engineer by training. I'm not an infection control specialist, uh, but I do have about 30 years of combined experience in the design, construction, operation of healthcare uh, settings and biological research laboratories. And I'm part of the Northern Light team that's been supporting our, uh, our staff, our patients, and, and the community over the past five months. So it's been, uh, as we all know, a very interesting ride. So uh, I've worked with uh, this team on uh, uh, some questions with schools. We've made some tours. Um, and these are some of the things that we've, we've developed uh, during that exercise. So um, traffic control patterns. Uh, we need to rethink our access and ex exit strategies from the buildings. In recent years, we would restrict um, to a single point, mostly from a security standpoint. But now, how do we choreograph the arrival and departure of our staff, students, and visitors? Um, so this could include separate ent entrances for select grades. So maybe grades K through three enter from the east door, four through six from the west door, um, have designated directional signage. Okay, kids, you're coming in here, you're taking a right and you're going straight to your homeroom. Um, staff uh, are going to have to be offered uh, at the separate entrances uh, so that they can direct the kids. And maybe there's a separate entrance for staff as well for their protection. Um, one of the things in the conversations with some of the uh, superintendents is that they anticipate there'll be a fair number of uh, parents who may be comfortable with their uh, children attending in-person classes, but aren't that comfortable with them riding the bus. So the expectation is there'll be additional uh, um, uh, private uh, vehicles entering and exiting uh, um, your school zone. So, you know, uh, uh, will there be a separate entrance for them? Uh, will you have to potentially adjust your hours? because parents might be dropping kids off a little bit earlier or potentially a little bit later. Um, you might want to consider scheduling when groups access each entrance. So say bus number two waits until bus number one has discharged its students, they've cleared the vestibule, um, and now bus number two allows their students to disembark. Uh, similarly, if we're in like a university setting, staggering the schedules slightly to avoid all the classes in a building ending or starting at the same time, that could limit some of that cross traffic and the associated risk of, of cross contamination. Um, a question came up on placement of hand sanitizers, and I'm thinking the question really was, can we put um, alcohol-based hand gel uh, on the walls? Uh, obviously, uh, this is going to be age dependent to some degree. Uh, but the state fire code will not allow for alcohol-based sanitizers uh, dispensers to be placed above carpeted uh, surfaces. You can see how, as this would dribble, it could potentially saturate the carpet and become a hazard there. Um, 
the other thing to think about is, uh, um, again, age dependent, uh, uh, potential misuse. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I have five boys, so I, I, I can speak from experience on what they might or might not get into. So for some of the younger folks, we might want to uh, uh, have the uh, sanitizer dispensed individually or at least be supervised. Um, classroom configurations. So you're gonna have to be creative. You're gonna have to rethink your classroom layout. Can you remove or relocate um, some furniture, some equipment, et cetera, to allow for uh, a greater distancing between students or, or individuals? We're looking for uh, six feet roughly uh, uh, from nose to nose or, or head to head as, as we set up um, uh, the learning environment. So, uh, you know, if you can move some things around, clear out those things that may not be as critical uh, and you, so that you can fit more uh, students in in a safe, safe setting, uh, you need to be creative in that regard. Uh, turn desks in the same direction so students uh, aren't facing and, and breathing on one another. Um, again, it's, we're pivoting from, uh, from my experience has been, you know, we want kids to work together in teams, small groups. Uh, you know, you, you four go sit over here and, and work on this project. Um, if you do that and you put them at tables, uh, try to put them uh, uh, maybe only on one side, uh, not face to face again, or potentially at, at opposite uh, diagonal corners. So you can try to maintain that six foot distance better. And consider signage uh, 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 or taping uh, um, uh, identifiers where, where where uh, uh, desks should be or where students should sit to dis discourage students from rearranging chairs or desks. Uh, how to space students for lunch, classrooms and larger rooms? Well, you know, the question is, can students eat at their desk rather than uh, congregating at the cafeterias? Uh, if they can do that, that's gonna mean transporting food from the kitchen into the class and then waste back out after each meal. Um, if you do that, uh, can you use disposable or compostable uh, utensils or dishes so the person who's picking up that waste or or handling the um, the, the the knives and forks and so forth uh, uh, doesn't have to go back into the dishwasher uh, if that's not feasible then you know mandate the wearing of gloves by staff by the people who are picking up uh, soiled dishes to potentially reduce the chance of infections there um, Adapting PE classes or activities. So, I mean, you've got kids, they're full of energy. PE is part of their, their day. It, it's, it's, it's a critical part in my mind to uh, a successful a learning environment. Um, so, you know, how can we continue that? Uh, well, can you, can you move activities outside if possible, whenever feasible? You know, structured running, walking games, rather than free play for students. Um, you know, reduce exposure to shared equipment, swing sets, climbing stations, etc. Uh, I wish we had uh, a silver bullet answers for all of this at this point. Uh, it's it's really a multiple uh, pronged uh, effort, multiple things working in concert to overall reduce the potential for uh, um, for transmission. Special purpose rooms. So, you know, the same principles uh, uh, apply to the best of your ability, dis distancing and disinfection. Uh, staff lounges and break rooms, you know, similar to other areas, uh, have identified seating when staff are in the break room. This is especially important if they're eating or drinking because they have to remove their masks. Um, you know, reduce the amount of, uh, of, of shared equipment or disinfect between use. So, you know, wipe down the handle of the coffee pot. Uh, after you use it. Wipe down the handle of the refrigerator uh, when you uh, uh, reach in for your lunch or, or to get a cold drink. Uh, again, back kind of to uh, PE or, or special purpose uh, activities in a gymnasium, you know, limit exposure uh, through distancing, limit attendance uh, by non-essential visitors, identify assigned seating locations. You know, if you are allowing, um, you know, the sixth grade basketball team to play, uh, a put assigned seating so that uh, um, uh, parents and visitors uh, uh, are maintaining that distance. Or maybe if you can do it, um, you know, can you broadcast it? Can you put it on Zoom? Again, we've got to be creative. Uh, and I know it's a challenge, but this is a, this is a new, new world we're entering. And uh, um, the answers we give today may not be the same as the ones we give tomorrow. We have to be creative. Um, bathrooms. We want kids to wash their hands. But we also want to restrict uh, um, that cross-contamination by uh, uh, getting them 
you know, together in a crowd. So, you know, restrict the number of students that can enter a bathroom at any one time. Uh, increase the frequency of high touch cleaning in these communal areas. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be cleaned. You know, I had one custodian, you know, so do I have to go in and clean between every, every child? No, but really increase your frequency. You know, maybe you're hitting it uh, a couple times, two, three, four, five times a day. Hitting those high touch surfaces, the doorknobs, the, um, the hand wipes, um, you know, the, the stall doors, et cetera. Um, water fountains. So these are another, they're a communal uh, high touch area. Uh, if you can use water fill, uh, bottle fill stations, uh, those are great. Um, again, increase the frequency of cleaning if you're keeping these in surface, the surf, service, sorry. Um, but if you close the fountains, you know, work with your maintenance team. Uh, you need to remove dead water and pipes and uh, what we call dog legs to reduce the potential for uh, Legionella or other contaminants to develop uh, and, and have a plan to disinfect or flush the lines thoroughly before returning these to surface. Um, airflow, heating and cooling. So there's a broad uh, um, variety uh, in different buildings. Uh, primarily based on age. Uh, if you are lucky enough to have uh, uh, a building that has central air, an HVAC system, so work with your maintenance team. Review the ratio of outside air being brought, being brought into the building, uh, that ratio to recirculated internal air. Uh, as an energy efficiency uh, a standard for years, we would bring in so much outside air, but we would reuse or recirculate the air that we had already treated, either heated or cooled or, or dehumidified. So there might be an energy efficiency impact on this, but if you can adjust the amount of outside air, um, that can be helpful. Um, again, work with your maintenance team. Can you improve the efficiency of your filtration system? Maybe upgrade from a MERV uh, 80 to a uh, MERV 90. Um, you know, can that be increased without impacting the, the specifications of your system? If you don't have a centralized HVAC system and you need to have fans for a warm environment, rather than putting a fan in a window and blowing air directly in and across students, potentially um, uh, spreading a contaminant into the room, I try to turn the fan around so that it's exhausting the room. It's still moving air, but it's moving it more slowly. The makeup air will come from the adjacent space within the building, uh, but it will move and it will uh, uh, cool the room, uh, although, again, at a lower velocity than if the fan is blowing in. But it does take out that potential uh, directional uh, airflow that might blow across an, an infectious student and spread in that manner. Um, I'm going to turn this over now to a true uh, infection prevention expert, and that's Suzanne Morsehead. She's from Northern Lights Sebastopol Valley Hospital. And if you've got any questions for me, you can put them in the chat box or hold them to the end. Great. Thank you, Joel. Um, as Joel touched upon, he mentioned a little bit about high touch items, and I'm just going to continue along um, that conversation. And that's all items you should be assessing throughout your facility as to whether they're being touched frequently or not so frequently. And it's gonna help determine how often they need to be cleaned. The best suggestion I have is walk through your school through the eyes of your student. So you wanna look at everything from the perspective of the class that will be following. Um, you know, as you think about it, a second grader is gonna to touch different items than a 12th grader. Special ed rooms are different from a pre class. So look at every room individually as it's its own entity as, and then look at the facility together. Some areas that you really should look at, handrails going up and down the stairs, those are frequently touched. So if you have a second floor, that's something that you really should consider how often you're cleaning. And as Joel mentioned, um, doors, door handles, where you can leave the doors open. It's just going to make life a little bit easier. You're not gonna to have to touch quite so many items um, or have to wash them quite as frequently. And don't forget the staff. Look at their break rooms and office areas. Some high touch areas in those locations are the refrigerator door handles, break room tables. This is also a really good time to remind staff to clean their work areas routinely including their keyboards, mice, and electronics um, screens. Also, look at what are your soft surfaces. These are items that are inherently harder to clean, where you can remove them. Swap your carpet out for gym mats or yoga um, mats. 
if you can't remove the carpeting, use a yoga mat on top of it. Um, I've seen some schools that have provided, particularly in their younger grades, provided a yoga mat for every student. They're fairly inexpensive, five or six dollars a person. And then um, the students just have their own mat that they move with them and they can sit in those larger circles when they're appropriately spaced. Um, some items I see a lot in schools are beanbag chairs. I would just recommend removing all of those. They're really difficult to clean. Another particularly challenging item are the shared classroom resources, particularly books. Now, there are some ways to effectively use shared items. If you need to, one of the suggestions, and this is very specific for books, is have bins um, for each day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and have books for each particular day. Students can pick their book that they're reading that day. When they're done with it, it goes back into the bin, and then it just rests for you know a full week before another student would be potentially hand, handling it again. In that length of time, the book is more than adequately safe for the next student to handle it. Now, you've identified your high touch items as you've walked through the school and you removed what you can, you have a plan to selectively rotate items. So how do you clean it? And what do you use to clean? Well, I recommend just Google EPA COVID cleaners and it will take you to the EPA site. When you're there, you can type in the cleaner that you're thinking about using. And what it will do is it's going to let you know if it's effective to deactivate the virus that causes COVID. It's also going to let you know just how long you need to leave it on the surface wet before you make it so that it will be effective. Ideally, as you clean, you're going to use a cloth and wipe the surfaces and let it dry. And um, avoid as much as possible using spray cleaners or fogging the room. A lot of times what happens is in those situations, it just pushes the virus into another location and the cleaner that you're using doesn't have adequate time to keep it um, wet long enough to kill the virus. Also vacuuming, obviously you're going to be vacuuming your um, facilities um, very frequently. Just a couple of caveats around that. Uh, make sure that when you are vacuuming, there's a very limited number of students and staff that are in the location. And the vacuum cleaner that you're using should have a HEPA filter to help control the spread of anything through that process. Now, in spite of all of your efforts to keep COVID out of the school, there still is the potential for an outbreak, and that is very real. And this is where having good plans and screening and response come into play. Just like we do at Northern Light Health, have a very robust screening program, like Dr. Jones mentioned at the beginning. Keep it simple and consistent. Ask all of your students about symptoms and ask about their contacts as well. You know, make it, ask them, you know, is there anyone sick at, in your home? If you're going to have a very open um, absentee policy, you don't want anybody coming into your schools that may have somebody at home that's sick. Make it well known um, that if a student has a very mild symptom, such as a stuffy nose, that's still enough of a risk factor where they shouldn't be coming into the school. It's really important as well to make sure that you have a place away from other students um, in case you have a student that becomes ill while they're on your campus. Now, keep in mind, wherever this location is, there could be a considerable amount of time between when the student develops symptoms and when a parent can come and pick them up. So it needs to be in a place that you can keep them segregated from the rest of the students and staff for a fairly extended period of time because you don't want to move them from one location to another as you need a, whatever the location is that you're using. If you can, keep this isolation area away from a high traffic area. And even better, if you can keep it close to an exit so that way when the parents come to pick up the student, there's an easy exit for them that doesn't allow the student to come back through the traffic, higher traffic areas. 
as you look at your staff and students, just keep in mind that there's different risk factors um, between the staff and students. Um, staff may have risk factors that make them more susceptible to serious illness. So in-class instruction may be very concerning for them. If you can, consider some options such as remote teaching. Um, even if you have your students in class, um, I've worked with some schools where the teacher may not be in that location just because of their own personal risk factors. Also, in terms of student considerations, some younger students may not be able to tolerate masks as well, or they may have some medical conditions that preclude them from wearing them. Make a plan for these students in advance. So you may need to have these students coming in and out of the facility through a different entrance. They may, you know, you may only have them there part time, but something so that you can eliminate or at least minimize the contact that they have with other students. The other item with students is they're not always the best historian, so they may not tell you or realize to tell you that they were feeling ill the night before or if they come ill during your school day, they may not be able to accurately report who else they've been in contact with. So as educators, just pay attention to what their normal circle and natural groups are, just in case somebody gets ill. For everyone though, one of the most critical parts of your school year is going to be at the very start. Everybody's coming back from a variety of locations. Some people have traveled to other parts of the country, and they're all going to be keeping bringing those risk factors back to the school with them. As the year starts, you're going to have increased contact among individuals that have not seen each other for months and months. And it's going to be natural, particularly for the kids to kind of, you know, run to each other, um, have more close personal contact. So you're really going to want to intervene and really try to work with keeping your students um, distant from each other. Now, to understand how contacts work and what are concerning contacts, I recommend that you have somebody within your school learn about contact tracing. Generally, this is the school nurse. And not that I expect any school to be doing contact tracing. If there's an outbreak within the school, public health will be the ones coming in and doing and assisting with that process. But by understanding what contact tracing is and who are concerning contact, contacts, it'll just make your school safer. And you'll be able to base some really good practical operational decisions based on what would be a contact and how you're keeping that school safe. I have attached a link to the slide presentation that does offer a free class for school nurses to take. I believe most school nurses have already received this um, through the School Nurse Association in the state. But if you haven't taken um, the opportunity to take it, I highly encourage it. None of this is going to be easy. And as Dr. Jones mentioned, expect the guidance to change regularly. And just know Northern Light Health is here to help you through this. Thank you, and thank you all for the collaboration you have been doing to assist our school districts. Next, I'd like to introduce Chris McLaughlin from Northern Light Acadia Hospital, who is seeing firsthand the hardships COVID-19 is causing on our children's mental health. So Chris, what do, you, so what do school administrators and staff need to keep in mind? Hi, Karen, and thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to be with everyone today. And I first want to say a special welcome to friends and colleagues who are attending today's presentation from districts that we've worked with all over the state. We know that there's just so much here to think about and plan for. And just know, as others have said, that we are here to support you, your districts, and your students. So it's important to keep in mind that 80% of youth with anxiety disorder disorders just don't get the appropriate treatment they need to address these concerns and, and recognize that this statistic comes to us from pre-COVID-19 research. We have no way of knowing yet how this pandemic has impacted or will continue to impact 
the treatment needs of kids and families going forward. And so we need to be mindful that schools also provide an amazing amount of behavioral health interventions and treatment for students during the course of the school day. And remote learning has challenged all of our abilities to ensure that kids are safe, supported, and healthy. So it's more important than ever before to recognize and be aware of the symptoms of anxiety of kids of all ages, but also to recognize how COVID-19 has elevated these symptoms in both adolescents and younger children. And so what we're seeing in adolescents is this increase in restlessness, agitation, frustration, anger, and worry. Teens are expressing feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. They're teary and sad, losing interest in things that they once really got a lot of joy from. You may be seeing fingernail chewing, hair tugging, or other physical bodily symptoms like kids complaining of that feeling of having butterflies in the stomach, rapid breathing, heart rate, or for some adolescents, a clenched jaw that may make t talking or even eating difficult. In younger kids, regressive behaviors, kids that are going back to baby talk, bedwetting, thumb sucking, maybe having challenges sleeping alone, wanting a nightlight on, or chewing or sucking on blankets or clothing, their moods are fluctuating and rapidly changing. Their sleep is disturbed. They may be waking up with nightmares like they've not done before and an exaggerated startle response. Changes in appetite, increases in motor activity, and again, that skin picking, hair tugging, and nail chewing, those physical symptoms that you as parents and caregivers can recognize. And the big idea here is that by recognizing these stress symptoms, it helps both kids and the adults identify just when more help is gonna be needed. There are some strategies that we at Northern Light Acadia like to teach youth to help them manage their anxiety symptoms on their own or build an action plan or a safety plan for them. We talk to kids about making time for themselves and staying connected with loved ones and trusted friends. These are friends that really make the teens or, or children feel good and happy about themselves. We wanna walk kids through self-talk strategies so that they can say in their own head, I'm okay, I know who I can talk to and it's okay to feel what I'm feeling. We want adolescents especially to limit their caffeine intake, soda, coffee, and energy drinks, and be aware of how much of the sugary processed snacks they're eating, things that may exacerbate those feelings of jitters or anxiety or worry. It's important for kids to be able to identify the trigger. What happened just before I started feeling this way? And we have kids that are able to journal and have their anxiety diary and spell out what triggers they have and how to avoid them. It's absolutely okay for kids of all ages to distract themselves, just like we as adults sometimes do with a good book, their favorite music or band, or re-watching favorite TV shows or movies, especially that elicit laughter in them. We want kids to find ways to engage in physical activity that's meaningful for them. Not all kids are going to be able to put on tennis shoes and run laps around the neighborhood, but for other kids, taking the stairs a few more times, getting out in the yard and playing with family pets or siblings, tossing a ball back and forth, or even walking down to get the mail. Just that little bit of extra activity may be what they need to kind of help get some relief. And kids, like adults, should never underestimate the positive effects that the sun, our pets, our favorite hobbies, and what the feeling of helping others can bring to us. We also talk about a roadmap of sorts of how parents, caregivers, and educators can lead kids through resiliency building skills. Families and classrooms that problem solve together and bring youth into the decision making process are building resiliency skills in those kids. The ability to check in with kids often, both verbally as well as providing opportunity for nonverbal check ins as well, is very important. And by nonverbal, I may mean a kid might be able to communicate with you with a post it note or color coding their attire. So a green day means I'm okay, mom, but a red day means I might need some more help. When I put that red ball cap on, I need some support today. 
be mindful of screen time. And trust me, I know how difficult it is to talk about screen time when remote learning is so prevalent and behavioral health and, and primary care services are being delivered by, via t telehealth as well. So it's just this caution around uh, be kind, my, mindful of the kind of screen time that's happening and encourage some limits. Maybe the screen time gets shut off a lot earlier than it used to get done. Laughter is so important for everyone, even kids. Predictability and routines and schedule is also super important. That's been one of the uh, I think more prominent features of the pandemic is this disruption of everything that once was felt so routine and that we were able to respond to. And so making room for youth to have control in that schedule is also really important. And that may be as simple as meal planning, having the, having the kids help identify what the family meal plan looks like for the week just gives them that little bit of control in the schedule. Practice and playing with masks and social distancing now more than ever is going to help build that tolerance and build that resiliency for when school comes back into session. It's important that kids be able to ask questions and that the adults around them are able to answer those questions with honesty and transparency. A focus on good self-care, especially sleep hygiene. We all know how important sleep is, and even more so for kids. So making sure that we have some consistency in the go-to-bed and wake-up times. And also just as important, know when and who to reach out to for more help, whether that's your primary care physician, your school guidance or school social worker, or experts like those of us here at Northern Light Acadia Hospital when treatment might need to be initiated. Again, keeping in mind that the big idea here is that parents, caregivers, and educators can encourage participation in everyday easy strategies that will help build resiliency. It's also important to validate the effects that COVID-19 has had on all of us. And one way that I've found that's been very helpful for me and others that I've worked with and talked to is by looking at Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's grief and loss model, where we can use a model that may once have been built to talk about death and dying, but also apply it to the grief that we've had around losses of everyday life. And that's everything from the sporting season, to the prom, to graduation, and grief and loss of what's to come. We just heard how lunch might look really different, how social time with kids and, 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 and fellow coworkers even may look really different. And it's important for us to make the opportunity to allow us to go through these stages of denial, allowing us time to adjust to the loss, anger, giving us a temporary solution for what we're feeling so much easier to feel anger for all of us than it is to have that feeling of being lost at sea. That bargaining stage where we get into what if and if only thinking just to find a temporary, temporary truce for what's going on around us. Keeping in mind that depression is the absolute appropriate response to loss. And then acceptance, which doesn't mean that you're okay with the loss. It just means that we've accepted the reality of that loss. And it's so important to keep in mind that these stages aren't always linear. We all find ourselves maybe having that day where we're feeling better about what's happening. And then we get knocked off our pedestal and we go back to that denial anger stage. We can play with this around and around we go. But the big idea is that the stages of grief and loss help us process our grief experience and give us a common shared language of how we talk about loss with each other and our children. Just like the model of grief and loss can help us move forward with this process, the tasks of mourning, J.W. Warden's model of mourning, is equally as important, keeping in mind that mourning is the external process of grief. I can't see your grief, you can't see my grief, but what we can see are the behaviors and actions that we are taking to help move through the grief, and that's what mourning does. Mourning allows us to accept realities of loss, work through pain, adjust to life, and main the connection while moving on to life. And again, keeping in mind that the idea here is that the deceased 
isn't necessarily the loss of a loved one or a pet. It's the loss of normalcy, consistency, predictability, and connectedness that has been brought on to us by COVID-19. There are everyday rituals that we also can participate in and encourage our children to participate in. Rituals to commemorate are those sometimes very small, easy to do actions that allow us to memorialize this moment in time, this moment in history. So what you see here are several suggestions of ways that families and classrooms can help kids work through some of this mourning. Rituals allow us to take an active role in the mourning of our own and the mourning of others. And so here are some suggestions to do those things. I think the idea of a time capsule, a playlist, creating a garden, or putting a note inside of a hot air balloon and letting that balloon just go are all real easy everyday ways that we can help loved ones and ourselves process those emotions that have come up during COVID-19. Thank you, Chris. The information you shared is not only such, um, such useful, useful information for those in schools, but also for parents as well. So thank you so much. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christy Townsend from the University of Maine. Dr. Townsend, during these challenging times, communication that is clear and easy to digest is essential. Where do we start in order to keep people safe? Great, thank you, Karen. So I do biomedical research at the University of Maine, so I'm used to communicating my own science uh, to other scientists, but also to the public. And also as part of the UMaine Systems uh, Scientific Advisory Board for COVID-19, uh, we've been working to distill all the scientific and medical research um, to different audiences, including the faculty, staff, and students at University of Maine. So today I'll share with you some of what we've done at the university, but also what the experts and the research say are good um, approaches to communicate complex topics like health literacy. So I'll start with some take-home messages for schools. Uh, the first one is if you're opening face-to-face -face, or if you're not, or even if you have a hybrid model for the fall, um, it's important to communicate why you're doing that. Um, as part of that process, you can seek feedback and involvement from your faculty and staff and students. Um, you can do surveys to figure out what struggles might exist for compliance if there's uh, requirements for new behavioral changes. Um, and to increase that discussion and, and back and forth uh, involvement, you can hold open forums and town halls where you have discussions and allow some Q&A sessions. Uh, the different uh, groups of people, so the staff, the parents, and the students will all need different messages tailored to them, um, especially if there's different types of behavioral changes that you'll be requiring of each of those groups. Uh, you may also need external messaging plans for your greater community around your schools. So it's a good idea to have a communications team and a communications plan in place and to include healthcare experts in that planning. Um, you also could create a centralized repository of your guidance online, uh, including maybe FAQs that you have, and just make sure that those are current and dated because as we've seen, the information with COVID-19 changes rapidly. Um, you should share what precautions are being taken uh, by the institution versus what you're asking from parents and students. And when you do that, make sure you're sharing the science and the reasoning behind those requests. It's often easier for people to make big changes in their behavior when they know the reason. And can you continue communication regularly? So for example, you can share reputable resources with experts, articles or infographics or things you've found that might help to continue the conversation. And we, uh, research shows that you get better compliance uh, through voluntary buy-in versus strict enforcement. So ways to um, help increase the number of people who are willing to wear a mask or wash hands the right way, et cetera. You can use social media and memes, especially for students. Um, you can um, train some peer messengers and ambassadors who can help spread the message uh, to people at their own level. And you can promote critical thinking exercises to help people um, get themselves to the logical conclusion of risk reduction. And especially for schools, what we can do to accomplish that is to incorporate all of these ideas into the curriculum itself. So what I've learned from colleagues who communicate controversial science quite often is there's some techniques that you can employ and these work well for COVID-19. So the first one is tailor the message. Who are you talking to? Make sure that you make the message personal. Avoid jargon. So use simple language to make the information accessible. 
listen to what the person is saying, ask them questions and try and learn their viewpoint, especially if they're not agreeing with you. Uh, for example, about mask wearing, it's important to know where they're coming from to be able to reach them. The next one is storytelling. So when you're conveying complex science, it's good to have a narrative and sort of create a story with it. Uh, the human brain responds very well to stories. And also use analogies and metaphors. So complex concepts can be more easily understood if you use an analogy or a metaphor. So if you feel like you're someone who's already pretty well informed about this pandemic and the virus, how can you help people around you? So these are um, four steps from the experts. So the first one is start where you are. So you can be the nerd note of trust just for your friends, family, and community that you're interacting with every day. So start there, start local. The next one is to pick your balance, uh, pick your battles, sorry. So there's lots of um, bias that affects people's judgments. So first start by affirming the shared values that you have, and maybe that's the health of your community, and then move from there into more controversial topics. Avoid repeating misinformation. Uh, this one can feel a little counterintuitive, but when you repeat things that are incorrect, you inadvertently reinforce it. So it's better instead to focus on the things that are factual. And lastly, it's good to be as honest and as transparent as you can. So as new information comes out, don't be afraid to change your position. Um, acknowledge the limits of your knowledge. So even for scientists, we have to say sometimes we don't know the answer to things. Um, and help whoever you're talking to build the tools to foster healthy skepticism so that they themselves can start to interrogate the information and the process. So some final thoughts, and again, these come from the experts in conveying this type of information. So the first one is downplaying a threat is just as bad as overemphasizing it and crying wolf. So try and be accurate in your assessment of the risk. Keep the message simple and easy to understand so that you can get it out quickly and you can get it out broadly. So wait for complex ideas. For example, right now, flattening the curve is a more complex idea until people are more invested in simpler ones, like what is the proper way to wash your hands to ensure that you're not spreading virus. Chunk the information so it isn't overwhelming. So this is a common study technique that students will be familiar with. So start with bite-sized parcels of information and not a huge um, uh, amount of information to start with. And lastly, it's okay, again, to emphasize what we don't yet know about the virus, what isn't yet confirmed by research, or it, what isn't yet a consensus, um, because that also helps convey just how science works in general, that we're constantly evolving. Thank you very much, Dr. Townsend, and we truly appreciate you joining us this morning. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Jim Jarvis. Dr. Jarvis joined, joins us each week to provide us with important updates on COVID-19. Dr. Jarvis, are there other special considerations from a health standpoint for our schools that you'd like to share? There are, Karen. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. I really want to talk about the arts, physical education, and, and organized sports. Uh, we recognize that that is important to our children's learning, um, and in fact, children do better when they have access to such things. But unfortunately, they do present some unique challenges and uh, as Karen said, I try to give the most up-to-date information, and so I'm gonna talk about um, information from just yesterday. Uh, but remember, anything that we say today could change tomorrow um, with this particular virus. When we talk about chorus, brass, and woodwind, woodwind instruments, um, right now, because those have been shown uh, on forced exhalation to actually spread uh, droplet particles as far as 14 feet, um, it becomes a challenge for us. And so right now, we do not recommend that those happen indoors. If, if you want to uh, pursue activities that can allow for singing and uh, the use of brass and woodwind instruments, uh, they should really be outside, uh, masked if possible, though we know that would be difficult with instruments, uh, but all students need to remain at least 14 feet apart from one another. And as Joel said, should be facing in one direction, uh, not facing at each other. Um, for activities like non-musical theater, uh, it may be safe to do that inside, but we still recommend outside uh, if outside wearing a mask, you can the participants can remain six feet apart. If they can't mask, then they also have to follow that same 14-foot rule. As we know, some students can project their voice very well um, and, again, can project those particles. Um, when inside, if they're going to do inside uh, um, acting or theater, those, then they have to be masked that entire time and remain six feet apart. Uh, physical education is also a difficult one for us. We want our students to remain active. Um, however, we know, again, forced exhalation during activity uh, can spread the virus more readily than in other areas. 
again, recommending that this be done outside um, and that uh, students remain at least 14 feet apart. If it is, if physical education activities are gonna be done inside, then they need to be done, uh, they need to remain six feet apart. Again, making it very difficult to do uh, team sports. So thinking about, as Joel said, some of those uh, unique activities. Um, I do wanna make a quick update on testing and that's for schools. We don't recommend uh, testing with, uh, with antigen tests um, or PCR testing uh, for the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. Um, we think that, that uh, there's just some inherent problems with the testing for asymptomatic individuals. So we, I, I do wanna reinforce that we really want you to do screening and having that screening occur at home uh, by parents and caregivers prior to your child either entering the bus or the school um, because that will prevent us to have long lines at each entrance way uh, for the schools uh, if they had to do the screening themselves. And with that, I think it's time for us to open up to questions. Karen? Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Jarvis. As always, you're a wealth of knowledge. Um, so we'll focus on questions, as Dr. Jarvis just said. If you have any for the panelists, please um, enter them into the chat box. Um, we or I will try to group the questions together so we can address as many as possible. Um, and Dr. Jarvis, the first one's going to be a follow-up asked by uh, Mr. Steely. Um, what about instruments with covers on them? Is that a good alternative? Um, it may, and I don't have any data to support this, it may mitigate, but it wouldn't change the recommendations that I put forward for you. Um, think about that. Most of our uh, woodwind and brass instruments also have spit valves in them. And so, uh, so there are some other ways that the virus could be spread um, outside of just the actual exhalation during instrument use. And so again, uh, that, that distance is incredibly important in these, in these areas. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Suzanne, the next question is for you. And then again, this came from one of our participants. Um, inquiring about any available trainings that might be useful for custodial staff in regards to proper cleaning for COVID. I would first recommend going to the EPA site and that's going to provide the biggest wealth of knowledge in terms of what to use, what not to use, how, how to use it effectively, and then um, going to the CDC site and just um, do a search on that CDC site for how to effectively clean a particular type of um, equipment or surface. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm gonna to toss the next question to you as well, Suzanne. There is um, some debate on whether a face shield can or should replace a mask or be used in conjunction with a mask. Uh, could you please share your thoughts on the issue and could you also speak to what type of face covering is most appropriate for the school setting? Sure. Now, face masks and face shields really aren't equal in terms of the level of protection. The absolute best protection is something that covers both the nose and the mouth. And in a school setting, it's really what you're trying to do, as Dr. Jarvis mentioned, is you're trying to prevent the spread of that virus and to minimize the impact through that exhalation portion. So cloth is generally okay. Um, however, um, I've seen pictures on the internet of cloth masks that um, have multiple holes, gaps, using something like gauze. So it just needs to be something that adequately would slow that down. A bandana is fine. There's a variety of you know, different masks out there. The one mask I would not use are masks that have a big um, exhalation valve right in the middle. They do absolutely nothing to filter the breath of the wearer. So they really don't help prevent that spread. In terms of face shields, it's it will help minimize the spread and there may be some very limited situations where that may be appropriate. However, ideally, you really want everybody wearing a mask or at least some type of face covering. Wonderful, thank you, Suzanne. Um, Dr. Jarvis, the next question I'm going to ask of you, um, um, one of our audience members is inquiring about um, pool testing. And I believe they're, they're referring to um, more of a universal testing approach. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, so pool testing has been uh, proven to be effective in uh, trying to decrease the amount of reagents used uh, by the analyzers or the machines that run the test. And what we mean by pool testing would be that we take the sample of several different individuals and put them all into one test tube and run that. If the test samples come back negative, then those group of people uh, would be considered to all be negative for the virus. 
Um, however, if it came back positive, you would have to retest each of those individuals to determine which one of them was the one that was positive. Uh, so that's where its limitations are. Um, it's also limitations is the number of specimens that can be pulled together. I have heard anywhere from three at a time up to 10 at a time. Um, I will tell you that right now, Northern Light Health does not do pooled testing uh, for a number of reasons, mostly because we are not, we are not challenged by the reagents um, needed to run the test, so it won't benefit, it, benefit us in that way. And secondly, we don't wanna have to subject somebody to a second test because that pool test came back positive. Um, so right now we are not doing that, but there are certainly some, some labs across the state that are doing pool testing, and it can be an effective way, again, to decrease the amount of reagent needed to be used. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis, um, and thank you for the clarification. I did want to share with the audience that um, today's panel panelists have agreed to stay on for another five to 10 minutes if the questions were coming in fast and furious, and they sure are. So I'm going to continue with the questions, and it may ex take us a little past noon, but I think um, we need to do that for, for the folks. So um, please continue to join us if you'd like. Um, and the next um, question is regards to um, Dr. Jarvis' temperature checks. And we know that the guidance from the DOE is recommending COVID screening, but it doesn't reference temperature checks, and that's being discussed by many schools. Um, can you um, chime in on that? Yeah, so we do ask that if a child states to their parent or caregiver that they're unwell, that yes, they should take their temperature because we know that children with a fever shouldn't be going to school regardless of what the situation is and wanting them to stay home and so that we don't spread any kind of virus or other, other infectious agents. But the reason why we don't recommend screening actually at the door is one, it's a challenge. Um, think about that, uh, those locations like, oh, at the TSA agent, where we all have to go through that metal detector. What happens? We all become backed up against one another. And so that actually makes it so it's difficult for us to do social distancing. Also with children, we know that temperature taking, regardless of the model, uh, can have some variation to it. And we really feel that there'll probably be more false positives, meaning people who test positive who don't have a disease, or false negatives, those who actually have the disease but don't have a fever. And so we really don't recommend that for, for school-aged children, um, particularly when they're, when they're entering into the building. But any child who feels unwell, yes, indeed, we do want them to have their temperature taken. Um, what we hope is, if they feel unwell, that they never make it to your door or to your bus in the first place. Wonderful. I'm going to throw the next next question to you, Chris, because we have a question regarding um, children and, and wearing face masks. And I know you've you've given a lot of thought to this. Um, do you have any recommendations on how parents or teachers can encourage children to wear face masks? I foresee this being especially challenging with the extended use. Absolutely. So right now, there's, I think, a lot that parents and families and caregivers can do to try to build some tolerance. And I think of it in terms of three Ps, practice, play, and pretend. Right now, I want families to be experimenting and practicing with different types of material just to see if there's uh, a type of material that kids can tolerate better than others. Masks that go over the ears versus the gator masks that come up. Kids may have different tolerances for those and play around with the fabrics. And, and if possible, if you're going to create some masks on your own, using a fabric that kiddos are already familiar with, maybe some old favorite t-shirts or an old blanket that kids are, are familiar with, might be a way to engage cooperation. And certainly the play and pretend pieces for younger kids, now's the time to be masking up those stuffed animals, to be doing some play and pretend with veterinarian roles or nurse, doctor roles, those professions that have historically worn masks for a long time and that kids associate with masking, play with selfies, play with cameras, create a, a mask journal or a mask scrapbook, and maybe do a mask fashion show. And for even adolescents, I think it's important to build up that tolerance level. So now's the time to have kiddos of all ages start that mask for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and try to stretch that out during the day. There, I know that there are going to be kiddos who absolutely are just not going to be able to tolerate a mask, whether it's a sensory-based issue or whether it's just a, a behavioral, I'm not going to do it, you can't make me issue, which for those of us working with teens know that comes up quite a bit. And so maybe if possible in the school, 
creating a mask-free zone that's buffered and, and protected in other ways to give kids a break. If they, if they can do that mask for 10 minutes and get that instruction, maybe there's a zone in the classroom or somewhere else in the school where they can get a mask break, but the room is, is done in a way that's safe for all. And I think finally just to find the best way to embrace the virtual learning. Maybe kids can't do every day in the districts that we're working with. There's some flexibility in, in the amount of time kids may be able to do in the classroom versus uh, remotely at home for those families that can do that. So it's all about cooperating towards solutions. Wonderful tips, Chris. Thank you so much. I'll be using those with my children. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Jones, the next question I'm going to toss your way. Uh, the main Department of Education asks that schools create a process for triage and monitoring of symptomatic patients, uh, students, as well as ask schools to establish a protocol for dis uh, decision making in regards to an ill student or staff. And one of our participants participants asked what should they do um, if a student or a teacher were to test positive. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, I do. It's a great question. I, I think alluding to what Dr. Townsend commented on, this is a complex evolving medical topic or science topic that you probably need to break into constituent parts. Uh, and to Dr. Jarvis's point, trying to find out about individuals' health or lack of health prior to their arriving at the school campus is great. But obviously, someone's going to show up, they're going to have a snivel, and it's going to be a coronavirus problem. The Department of Education, I, I'm sure, recognizes, as I alluded to in the beginning of the meeting today, that different school districts have different physical plant issues, different um, milieus with regard to the individual parents' perspectives on whether kids should, should wear masks at all, whether coronavirus exists, and all those things. Um, the recommendations for what to do with the school are complex, in part because um, you don't really find out that you've had an individual who's sick until well after they've come and gone. And by that time, contract tracing becomes very complex. Uh, the schools are places where people come, except for boarding schools perhaps, where people come and stay for a portion of the day, whether it's a full day or not, and then go back out in their community. So they've come from the community, they've returned to the community, and you're just a part of it. Like a grocery store with a you know similarly important function. Uh, so I think trying to figure out, okay, it's the process of tracking what's occurring among your staff and your students is going to be imperfect and accepting that. And then working with your local healthcare community, frankly, to partner to determine how do you respond as circumstances may be one individual with known COVID or perhaps a COVID or we don't know when they got it or maybe they're at the tail end of the disease or maybe they don't have active disease at all but just have a positive test. That can all get very complex when you sprinkle in influenza season. And things that make that plus fear plus lack of solid science, or at least evolving science, uh, make this planning difficult. As, as I mentioned, I think the most important thing to use in planning is a pencil. So you can erase things and change your plan as you go. Thank you, Dr. Jones. One more question, and I'll, and I'll close it with uh, Dr. Jarvis. Um, Dr. Jarvis, are you aware of any research on adults giving the virus to kids or kids giving to kids, but not so much kids giving to adults? I read that word for word. <laughs> yeah, so we do know that um, children right, seem to be less likely to be infected with the virus, and those children under the age of 10 are less likely to spread the virus to others. So very different than we know with other viruses, um, particularly uh, with school-age children. And so again, COVID-19 acting differently than anything else we've ever seen. Um, but yes, spread can still happen. Uh, spread can happen certainly from an adult who is infectious to a child. And we see that um, in, in these little um, outbreaks that we've had uh, where it is much more likely that you're infected by somebody within your household than you are from out in the community, um, though we know community spread still exists. So yes, indeed, if, if we look at a school and particularly a classroom as a household, um, then yes, spread can happen from child to child, child to adult, or more likely adult to child um, with this particular virus. Thank you, thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists today. That will conclude our question and answer portion of today's session. If you have a question that wasn't answered today, I invite you to reply to Lainey Abbott, who's the contact for today's Zoom session, um, with your question, and she will make sure that one of the panelists um, responds with, with an answer for you. Just a reminder, we will be emailing you a survey right after our conference today. 
please be sure to give us your feedback so we can continue to provide relevant information and insights to collectively and safely reopen Maine. Be sure to register for next week's session. Dr. Shaw, the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, will be joining us for a conversation about the past present and future as it relates to COVID-19. And we'll have plenty of time for you to ask questions as well. Please feel free to invite friends, colleagues, and others who might benefit from the weekly series. We, by working together, we will help Maine safely open back up for business. Again, on behalf of Northern Light Health, thank you for all that you do for Maine's youth. We wish you the best for the coming school year. Have a wonderful afternoon and please be well.